But um, what was I going to say? <clears throat> oh, there's a book. Do you know the book of the Harajuku fashion in Japan? The um, High Chase and the Dragon. Did you ever um, get the book? It's called Fruits. And there's another book called Fresh Fruits. There's a designer named Cheryl Koo who used to be a student of mine. And um, she's a dancer too, a hip hop dancer. And she's really stylish. She used to have a brand called The Other Duck. I don't know if she still does. She is featured in my book, The Language of Fashion Design. Hi, you do. Welcome back. But what I wanted to tell you about this book is um, you know, a lot of the stuff is cultural. Like that book is Japanese street fashion. It does have uh, some European influence, but you'll see that the, all the street fashion and street fashion in general is real life proportions. Um, the clothes are not super fitted in that book. They're, I think it's a Japanese you know, tradition. Things are layered and loose and really cheerfully colored and patterned. And that book just kept home, sending the message home to me, page after page, that fashion, <laughs> fashion doesn't have to be tall, skinny, or fr really f um, extreme or distorted at all. <laughs> And I had that experience again when I lived in Paris and fell in love with the West African fashion that was there. There was so much fashion from Senegal, Mali, Ivory Coast. And um, again, the proportions were different. Clothes were voluminous. Bodies were a lot of, not everybody, you know, but a lot of bodies were more full. And, and the thing is that the fashion, see, one thing I learned in design school is that I can be trained to anything. So we've been trained to see something so bizarre seem normal. Like, I don't know if you've ever been looking at a picture sometimes in a magazine, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, <laughs> that bicep is this wide. Or, you know, when you have like those Photoshop aha moments, um, it's, you've been trained to not notice anymore. And you've been trained to constantly think there's something wrong with your body. Guess what? <laughs> Guess what? There's all kinds of bodies out there. And there is fashion that can be the best for every kind, for every age, for every shape, for every stage of life. If you're nursing, if you're pregnant, if you've gained weight, if you're fit, uh, fit, if you're you know, an athlete, there's so much out there. And I feel badly to know that fashion students, lots and lots of women with big dreams, go to school and they're like, in, they're right on uh, trained to, it was like the big initiation to fashion school was learning fashion proportion. What was fashion proportion? You take the length of the head and you let that be like one ninth or one tenth of the length of the whole body. So you can do that right now. You can draw like a little oval and draw 10 more ovals the same size below it and see what that looks like and try to make a body proportion that's like four heads is head to crotch and the rest is all leg. And you see what that does. Because I have beautiful portfolio work from when I was in school, but guess what? It's, um, it's scary. Like a lot of it I don't share anymore because it's really scary <laughs> what the legs look like, what the arms, how emaciated everything is. And yet the design is good. Why couldn't I have been designing for people? Why wouldn't we design for our own body? It doesn't stop it from being amazing. It doesn't stop it from being fashion. It doesn't stop it from being wow. It just stops it from being unrealistic. It just stops it from being perhaps oppressive or exclusive. It makes it more real. Personally, and I don't know if you've had this experience, but when I see fashion images or have fashion experiences that are outside of that range of sizes and stuff, I get like goosebumps. I feel so connected and I realize that, oh, when I can see myself in what I'm looking at, or when I can see humanity in a, in a way that's palpable and real and not that totally like off in a glass box image of fashion or women or people, I, I feel so energized and excited about fashion, like almost like almost like a brand new inspiration, a whole new revitalization of um, connecting with expre physical expression, fashion. <laughs> oh my gosh, wait, I just have to like share the park. Oh, well, I guess nobody really wants to talk about, I don't know what it is with my scoops. Nobody talks on my scoops. <laughs> Hello, thanks for joining. 
I'm in Washington Square Park. What are you guys doing? Where are you? Why'd you hop on? I'm just curious where people are at, um, where people are signing in from, whether you're New Yorkers, whether you've ever been, have you ever been, hello, have you ever been to Washington Square Park before? <laughs> Thanks for the hearts. I love hearts. It's like a little fountain. Tick you're tickling my chin. Stop. <laughs> Niteroi? No. Neturdi? Is that Brazil? Wait. Is that Niteroi? No. Niterd. Oh, well. I don't know what that means. Have you been here? Would you like to see New York? I can't stay too long. I have to head to Grand Central Station to catch a train with my amazing new boyfriend who I feel like I met my whole life to meet him. He's <laughs> totally different than anyone I met before, ever. He's just like, I feel like, I feel like so at home. It's wonderful. Single mom, three kids, 43, like totally new experience. Just a reminder that your life is always opening up with new chapters. Um, any questions about anything? Fashion stuff? school stuff, teaching stuff. Um, I really like having a, a place where we can talk about just living more full and authentic lives, whether it's around our art, our fashion, um, around where am I from? I'm from Connecticut. Yeah, I speak some French and I speak Portuguese. I mostly sing Brazilian music and jazz and that's because of this neighborhood it's because of this town where are you from Nitard Nitard is a place I had never heard of tell me more about it and how are you liking Periscope do you love it Azerbaijan oh so did I see you this morning this is a less exciting scope it's a little more like it's urban but it's kind of rural my, when I was married a long, 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 long ago, my husband had a dear friend from Azerbaijan. Best music, best food on the planet. And he told us that it, Azerbaijan is an incredible cultural place. So much history, so many traditions. What's fashion like in Azerbaijan? And are you a man or a woman? Or, <laughs> I don't know. I'd love to connect with it about these topics, but I might wrap up soon. Do you hear the tuba? Wait, I don't see it. I don't see it, but I hear, oh, it's a trombone. See, that's a beautiful coincidence. Hello, man. Okay. <laughs> Just curious, because I was talking a little bit about um, body image, women's body image and fashion. What do you think of... Um, the whole fashion model tradition. I don't know who I'm getting hearts from, but that's okay. But it's fun when you see a certain color and you're like, oh, I wonder who that is. I love that there's a trombone playing here because this whole day I've been thinking about my favorite trombone player because I used to go every Monday to Cafe Wa on McDougal and 4th Street down there. You're working with American guys in Azerbaijan or here? I'm so curious. Hi, Ido. <laughs> you're still with me. How are you? What's going on? I wish you could scope me from where you are. Yeah, see, there's like, look at this. There's like not much to see in the way of fashion. I'll tell you that. But this is downtown Manhattan, New York City. This is where like all the universities are. Downtown's kind of like hip and cool. You're good, I'm glad. Hope you're well, your family's well. Are you making anything today? Are you sewing? Are you designing? Are you researching? It's a great pleasure. Yay! Yeah, this is a this is a little like we have like a, like an Arc de Triomphe here, like in Paris, but it's tiny. And then we have a fountain here. And back in the days, very smart and polite. Oh, you, you mean American people? I hope you like us. That would be great. <laughs> we get mixed reactions wherever we go. And we're a mixed bag, like any place, I guess. See that um, fountain? I used to hang out here, children's clothing. Oh, and now you do strictly children's? 
I saw that quote you said the other day, all of them. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so glad you have a great experience with Americans. Idu, you were saying that you were proud because you got your nephew to wear indigo to school. So is that something that he doesn't want to do? Or is it she? I'm not sure. Because it like isn't cool or is it old fashioned or something? Or is it just, I was curious about that. Um, but at any way, it's a victory. <laughs> I'm glad that you shared it. Americans have the best smiles. Americans use a lot of braces. <laughs> I, uh, I could use braces, but you know, I don't think I'm ever gonna do it. I don't have the patience. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard to describe what this neighborhood's like. She thinks it's not cool. So how did you get her to wear it? Just by making it and because she loves you? She looks great. Smile is main. <laughs> um, yeah, when I was in elementary school, my mom made like all my clothes and it was totally not anything that was in style. <laughs> not at all. And then she, um, a few years later, the stuff that she made me became in style. It was all old fashioned at the time. It was like long, full denim skirts with like cotton eyelet petticoats. Petticoats, I'm not kidding. <laughs> Which was like unheard of. But then by 1985, people were wearing petticoats all over the place. So maybe she was ahead of her time. <laughs> I don't know, but I remember always feeling different and feeling outside. I told her African fashion was now the trend. You do, it's amazing to me because when I was in Paris and I was so, you know, I talk about it all the time, but I was so mind blown by the fabrics and the fashion. My vision right away was just like, oh, oh, I just want to, I just want to see more and more and more of that. But when I was in school, all the projects I did in those fabrics, my teachers kind of rejected. This is the stuff I'm talking about. You pay, like you go into debt for 30 years to go to a college that doesn't give, doesn't give you freedom to do what you want to do. It's absurd. It makes, teaches you to draw bodies that you cannot relate to at all. So you become completely separate from fashion, right? So, uh, yeah, now I see the fabrics getting more and more popular. I'm almost sad about it because I want it to be my little secret. <laughs> but it's okay, it's wonderful. Education in the U.S. Oh, wow, where, where else did you have you studied and what do you study? I did my education here. I did one year in Paris and I'm glad I did just because it's amazing to get to know different parts of the world, very different cultures, right? There's so many ways to live on this planet. Um, I had a student today who's Japanese, has lived in France or Paris. He's lived in New Zealand. Ah. Yeah, generally, oh, Edu. <laughs> I think we have so much in common. <laughs> I've been homeschooling my kids. I think institutions and systems of education are so controlling. I believe that, that a lot of schools treat you like if you weren't there, you'd be lazy and boring. Oh, environmental psychology. That's ecology. That's awesome. Oh, is that why you signed on to the ethical fashion conversation? Because it's all very related. And I feel that a lot of the ethical fashion and eco stuff is very much focused on um, the environment, which is amazing. I also think the environment is Mother Earth. Or female, maybe. I don't want to be sexist, but we, I think we need to incorporate a lot more of the female into our business models and in then something like fashion which tends to be a very exploitative nasty kind of business over here um, you know one step we can take is make let the women look like they look and amazingly like they look as magical amazing as we are um, as we all are there's so many I just find diverse beauties to be so much more beautiful than getting one kind all the time. Um, Edu, there's something I wanted to say to you. Yeah, so in homeschooling, I find that 
the kids, you know, they, they follow everything they're interested in. And I think we're all born with different aptitudes and different tastes. And nobody, no, people aren't born with a natural instinct to sit around watching TV. And uh, nobody lives in a vacuum. Nobody. I just don't believe it. So everyone has different paths different things different resources too but i don't believe it's i guess it's a spiritual thing i can't believe there's a creator or a god who's going to cut some of his or her children off from the source they come from so wherever you are it's all inside and it's all you could do anything maybe you can't do it maybe that's a very american way of thinking hello keith got an artist in the house I just don't believe that um, humans are that simple or empty I believe that we're very full and curious and we like to learn through play we learn through nice to meet you too thank you so much for joining I hope you'll you'll stop in on I do a lot of art classes but I also like to do talks I thought maybe I'd get some chat going today but I'm like super happy that I can be chatting with Idu from here, from so far away, my friend. Um, educational systems, it's amazing that people will give up so much money to be able to learn things that, especially now, they can learn by themselves, they can learn by themselves. And that we can feel so desperate that we'll need a piece of paper. I mean, yeah, if you're gonna be operating on people, maybe you need a piece of paper, but, uh, there are so many things that you don't need a piece of paper to thrive in and thrive at. And I'm a big proponent of that. I love to talk about that. And I also love, well, it's hard. A lot of single moms, a lot of, right? Aw. <laughs> so true. I mean, and the other thing, I don't think my way is the, only, the right way or the only way either. But I just love knowing that we have options or just looking at the less common truths from time to time. To know that um, it's the things that we don't realize we're thinking because they're so predominant that we need the most perhaps to be freed from sometimes. So education is, is every day. Education is curiosity. Education is your experience. When I think of all the moms, you know, you can't put on a resume that you were a mom. Well, it's not like you were living in a vacuum. <laughs> moms have all kinds of experiences. Dads do. People who aren't moms and dads do. There's the most important things that make up who you are are not on your resume. <laughs> right? Thank you for the hearts. <laughs> it's like the silliest thing ever. And you have a resume and people worry, oh, there's a gap on my resume for that year. I took care of my sick mother. <gasps> yeah, you took care of your sick mother. I love that so many walls are falling away in this era. I love that education is happening like that's what I love about my course you know you can do it on your time all you need is Wi-Fi you know show up when you feel good when you're focused and motivated when the kids are asleep when uh, none of this you know bow to me drive three hours get into student loan debt so that you can then go to a job where you do whatever they tell you because you're an indentured servant but you have a message to share. You have a gift to share. You have a life to design. And that's what I'm so much about is designing fashion is one thing and designing your life is primary. And uh, that was something that happened <laughs> many years learning after I finished school. Life is a school. What's that song? It's a Thelonious Monk song someone wrote lyrics to. It's like... Life is a school, unless you're a fool. But the learning brings you pain. So life is a school, unless you're a fool. And I don't believe anyone's a fool. I think we all have curiosity. I think we all have love. And we should be following it and tapping into it. I spent so much of my life being taught, like, Life is suffering and work hard. I work hard and I've suffered too, <laughs> a lot. But I, I'm in a phase right now where my, I'm willing to believe that my happiness has a purpose <laughs> and to follow my true happiness and see where it takes me. 
give it a chance at least. You know? And as I do, things keep happening. Like I told you, that trombone started playing, right? Well, I've been thinking about this trombonist all morning because I'm in the neighborhood where his band was and I saw his band play like a hundred times and it brought so much joy to my life. And I danced and I sang and I dressed up and I parked like right over there and would go and walk these streets singing at the top of my lungs. And then I come here and I'm thinking about him and there's a trombone playing. You see, he's gone now too. So, um... I feel the more that I listen to my happiness, the more of these experiences and strange coincidences pop up. And um, sometimes when you're forced to face a really big fear, like when I lost my full-time position, when I had my child and a new boss and got squished into this difficult situation, it was almost like I didn't have a choice. So I was forced to face the fear of not having that job anymore and raising this child. and and my other kids too, and every day is a miracle, but it's still working out. And my business was born of that, and all the connections. I wouldn't even be here today if I was hidden away in the happy, safe, secret halls of the school that used to, that employed me. Actually, I still teach there, but I just part-time, but <laughs> anyway, so embrace your, don't let your fears overcome you. Because if I'm still here, you're still here, we're going to keep on keeping on. It's good, good stuff. And it's, it's not winter yet, so check in with me in six months and I'll be like, oh, I think life is cool. I think maybe, I can't remember. And I'll be like all pale and... <laughs> ah. And that's when I'm 